Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, we're going to talk about this morning. Everybody say talk about. Now, we're going to talk about, preach about, teach about under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, unction of the Holy Ghost. We're going to be ministering this morning on your words, your tongue, your future. Yeah, your tongue. Second row. Melanie, I'm going to get you. Pastor, you old. I, what? <laughs> Does anybody know where John John got it from? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know how John John is. He just tells it like it is. Yeah. Now, now. Jeff, after church, you can come by and, and pound it and say, you're right, Pastor. You don't have to do it in front of her and get in trouble. I ain't going to get you in trouble that way. Just do it on the slide on the way out. Let's go to James, the third chapter this morning. Words are the seeds that start the process of life. You know, in the beginning, God said, you know, let there be light. Let, you know, he spoke everything to existence. He formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in him the breath of life. Um, but words are the seeds. Words are seeds. Everybody say words are seeds. My words, say my words. My tongue determine my future. Glory. Hallelujah. Brett, my brother, starting in verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. Um, if any man offend not in word... The same is a perfect man, now that better translated mature man, and able to bridle the whole body. Now, James starts out and says this. He says, if you can control your mouth, you can control your body. That's why it's so stupid to run around and say that we're under grace. We can do whatever we want to. and get, you know, they don't, Some people don't actually come out and say it that way. But they, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm under grace. They're saying, they're, what are they doing? They're unbridling their body. They're taking constraints off their body by what they say. Amen. So he says here, you know, if any man can, what? Offend not in word. The same as able to, a perfect mature man able to bridle the whole body. Now, he goes now and goes into two different allegories. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. You can take a big old horse and make it go where you want it to go by putting a bridle in his mouth. I mean, you can take a Belgian. Everybody understand a Belgian? They are a big horse. I mean, them and, you know, you got, you got a few draft horses. You got the, the Gypsy Vayner. You got the Belgians. And you got, of course, everybody does the, the Clydesdales. But I'm going to tell you, a Belgian's a big horse. You know? I mean, you walk up to them, and, you know, you could just punch them upside the head. They wouldn't even feel it. That's a big horse. And, they, and they're so funny. They're funny. They, they, they love attention. You know, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, you could put a bit in that horse's mouth and make it go where you want it to go. You can take that big old bell, just put a little bitty bit. I mean, you're talking about a piece of, you know, metal maybe this long, or maybe a little longer depending on the mouth, and put it in there and put it on some reins and pull it this way and pull back on there here, and they'll go that way. Pull it the other way, they'll go. That big old horse. Now, he could jump up and stomp you in the ground if he wanted to. You know what I'm saying? A big. Then you walk behind him, don't let him know. He could kick you by halfway across the football field. All right? But because they're trained and they learn, we learn, we've learned that we can put a bit in their mouth and make them do things that we, they otherwise wouldn't do. All right? Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. So there's one allegory. Putting a bit in the horse's mouth. And then the next one. But also the ships. Which though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Now, we all know, and you're talking about a, a sail ship, you can take the thing and they, you, turn, you take and turn the, the rudder. Now, understand that the rudder may be pretty big, but in relation to the ship, it's small. Okay? So you take that, and you turn that rudder. How many of you have ever seen, anybody been down to Charlottesville on the, the, on the Yorktown, you know, the aircraft carrier Yorktown from World War II? Now, that's not as big as aircraft carriers are now, but that's a, still a big ship. I'm telling you, that's just a big ship. Been down to Wilmington to the battleship in North Carolina. And, you know, they, that was the second. Well, I think they had 18-inch guns. Uh, the, um, uh, the Yamaha, uh, whatever it was. Huh? 
Yamato, the Yamato and the other one, um, uh, they had they had 20 inch guns. Just 20 inch projectiles coming out of the thing. That's that's just. You take that thing and go up there to the control room and turn the helm, and that huge ship. Now again, in relation to us, phys us physically, that's a big piece of uh, metal coming down out of it. But I'm telling you, in relation to the ship, it's small. And so James takes two allegories and says, a bit in a horse's mouth, turns and controls the horse. The rudder of a ship controls the ship. Now, you know, you start turning a big old battleship or a big old aircraft carrier, they don't turn on a dime. It might take two miles to get it to turn 90 degrees. But you'll get it. Amen? And the next verse says, even so, the tongue. Now, he's given allegories saying these little things govern these whole huge, a bit governs an entire huge horse. The rudder controls and governs an entire huge ship. And even so, the tongue. What's he saying? The tongue controls your mouth, your life. Your tongue controls your life. Say, my tongue controls my life. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a little fire um, uh, uh, kindleth. A um, greater matter, a little fire kindleth. Your tongue can start something big. How many, how many of you have ever started a fire? What do you use to start a fire with? Kindling. Well, you use a match to get the kindling going, but you use kindling. You don't put a, you don't put a log on a, this, you know, this wide and this big around and stick a match to it and expect to burn it. You stick kindling down there, you stick small, small scraps of wood or small limbs, little bitty stuff, and you get the kindling going, which burns the smaller limbs, which burns the next slide's limbs, but you know what So you get a really good hot thing of those things, and then you actually you'll catch the big log on fire. The little kindling got the whole thing going. How great a matter a little fire kindleth. Your tongue is like the kindling to your life. You keep running that thing, and it's going to set on fire certain things. Now, let me tell you something. You, there's some things you won't set on fire, and other things you don't want set on fire in your life. You don't want certain things burning and, and, and producing in your life. Uh, your flesh is one of them. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Uh, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Now your tongue, if you don't control it, is going to set hell on fire in your life. Nature will take over. We cannot let your mouth just run off. Your words, your mouth is your future. And if you don't govern it, it will run off. They used to say you have diarrhea of the mouth. Hello. It's kind of a graphic description, but you get it. Okay? For every kind of beast. Hello, I'm sorry. Every kind of beast and the birds and the serpents and the things in the sea is tamed. And it hath been tamed to mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. Oh, what, what am I going to do? My tongue, no man can tame my tongue. Well, hold on to your seats. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Let's just stop there. Your mouth by nature is setting your life on course by the natural. You have been, when you were born into this world, you grew up, you learned to get all your information from what? What you saw, what you heard, what you smelled, what you tasted, and what you touched. From your five physical, your physical senses from the time you've been born. How many have ever seen babies? Hopefully y'all have. They crawl around, there's something on the floor, what do they do? Where does it go? You know, same thing with a puppy. Yeah, your puppy especially. I'm not going to confess ADHD over that dog. But let me, anyway, babies will put anything in their mouth. They will. Now dogs have to sniff it first. Then they put it in their mouth. But babies, I'm telling you, it goes in the mouth, you know? And, you know, and, and of course, as they grow, then, it, you know, other things begin to help. But in the beginning, taste is everything. Now, Jessie used to, she would eat. We could take her to a restaurant. Remember, they used to have that restaurant called Po' Boys down on High Point Road. Po' Folks, there you go, Po' Folks. 
Yeah, po' boy's a sandwich. Po' folks. And she'd go in there and get, get garden peas and just shove them up her nose. Yeah. They'd go all up her nose. <laughs> and she'd blow them back out, you know. I mean, it's, oh, she did some strange stuff. Anyway. Oh, you should have seen it. It was, it was You can't get her to touch a garden pea today. Because now she has other senses involved looking at it, the texture of them. She's just all that kind of stuff. As we grow in life, from you know, beginning with taste first, t- taste everything, everything in your mouth, then touching and seeing and hearing and smelling. As we go through, because you will eventually get where if it don't smell good, you don't want it in your mouth. I went to my grandmama's one time, and the first time I ever smelled chitlins cooking, cured me. Now you might like chitlins, or chitlins, but we always call them chitlins. Chitterlings, that's right. If you don't know what chitterlings are, it's a fancy word for hog intestines. They take them out there and wash them real good, supposedly. I always said they got better when you got corn in them. I mean, they won't clean good. Yeah. <laughs> you know. um, but I smelled chitlins cooking, ran out of the house. My, my dad said, let's go, kids. We got the car, just rode around for a couple of hours just to hope, hope the house would clear out when we got back. They were so na- nasty. You know, there's a chitlin festival down in South Carolina. You know what they do? They cook the chitlins in a town 30 miles away. Why? They smell so bad nobody would come. <laughs> and you got folks who go and buy them and even say, they're good. How can something that smells so bad be good? I don't know. But if somebody, if you eat chitlins, let me know how that works. I just don't get it. But anyway, you know, my smell got involved in my taste, you know, and I graduated. As we go through life, we begin to let our senses govern things, and our senses begin to control everything we do. Amen? We see something, we make an adjustment. We hear something, we make an adjustment. We touch something, we make an adjustment. We smell something, we make an adjustment. We taste it, we make an adjustment. Ever put something in your mouth and we go, <laughs> oh, God. I have. You, you, you get something that comes out and you, and you put it in your mouth before you're at a restaurant and you realize, I remember I was a Dominican Republic on my first uh, mission trip in Santo Domingo. And uh, we, we were at, staying at the Hotel Cervantes at that, right there, right there at the, um, at the uh, port in Santo Domingo. And um, they warned me. They said, look, Ed, you know, the, more, the beef here is not grain fed. It's not topped out. It's wild grass fed. doesn't taste like American beef. So it comes out and I bite into it. And I'm telling you, it tasted like the city dump smells. But man of faith and power, don't prove I got faith, took a second bite. I spit the second one out and didn't eat the rest of the Bronco burger at the Hotel Cervantes at Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic. And then we drove about three and a half, four hours over to Barona on the southwest coast, before, kind of near the, uh, Domin- uh, the uh, Haiti, Haitian border, in a minivan with nine people, 95 degrees, Nissan minivan where the engine comes inside the vehicle. My legs were on top of the end. That's the only place I could put my legs. I turned about 30 colors of green on a rotating basis. The man of faith and power found out he was just pasting powder on that trip. But my, my you know, see, it looked like a good burger. Picked it up, and yeah, it's back like, just like an American burger. But I bit it up, you know. My senses, you know, told me something's different. We have been trained our whole life to live by our physical senses. You look at your bills, and your bills say you don't have enough money in the bank. You look at the bank account, you look at the bills, there's not enough money to cover it. You look at your body, and the symptoms say you can't, you're not healed, you're going to die. The, you know, our, our senses tells us one thing. But we are believers, and we got to get our information somewhere else, don't we? Isn't that right? But let me say this. If you start saying what your senses tell you, you're going to say the wrong thing. There is nothing supernatural about your senses. Your senses will say what you got, not what you want. Hello? Hello? They will tell, now let me, let me say something. They're real. I mean, if you've got a, a tumor sticking out the side like this, it's there. Don't walk around saying, that's not there. No, 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 no. no that, that, we're not going to get into denial. We're not going to say, you know, deny something. That's not, that's not faith. 
Denying that something that's not there is not faith. Saying what God's word says about it, which is a higher law, is faith. Okay. There, uh, I, yeah, I see that. But according to 1 Peter 2.24, I believe that I received my healing. Therefore, my body must line up with the word of God. I thank you I'm, that tumor's dissolved and leaves my body in Jesus' name. Why? Because I'm the healed of the Lord because God's word says I am. I say what the word says. I don't say what I, what, I don't deny what I see. See, that's Christian science. Christian science, which is not a Christian religion, it's, it's, it's Gnosticism. Does, material is not real, that kind of crazy stuff. Denies reality. That's not faith. I said, that's not faith. Jesus didn't say you're not a fig tree. Jesus didn't say there are no leaves on you. No, he said, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever because you lied. You lied, 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 you lied to your dad. Anyway, sorry, little Atlanta Tams there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Who ever heard of the Atlanta Tams? Debbie? Lloyd, you ever heard of Atlanta Tams? Okay, all right. My son's heard of the Atlanta Tams. All right. The, okay, it's my show. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to come to the place that we understand that our words, our tongue, is our future, and we can change circumstances by how we talk. Now, let me say this. This is not the power of positive confession or positive thinking. Faith is birthed out of the Word of God entering into our being us meditating on that word of God until we are fully persuaded that it's so and then coming out as a declaration of faith. I shared in Winston this morning, there are a lot of people that came out of our circles, the charismatic word of faith nutbag circles. I was the biggest nutbag in the group back in the day. Back when I was young and old, I was crazy. You don't know how many signs in Eastern Carolina they had to go back and replace after I got done with them. Because they weren't stop signs, they were ghost signs. I got them converted in Jesus' name. They go back and fix it, all right? You know, you know, somebody tell you, look, I don't believe in love. That's the root word for Lucifer. You know, I was, I was a nutbag. Huh? Deprived lucky charms because they were, they were lucky. They were Lucifer root words. Lucifer charms. Of me preaching? Have you taken a picture of me preaching? I took a picture of you. Yeah, come on. I like it when y'all put stuff on the internet. Okay. Let me, let me do the, uh, the lineman pose for the trophy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, to, in order to change circumstances, you have got to stop saying what you have. Because your words and your tongue are producing your future. If you're constantly saying, I'm broke. If you're saying, I'm poor. If you're saying, I'm sick. If you're saying, I don't have this. If you're saying, I don't have that. You're saying, I'll never achieve this. Then guess what? Your words being declared by your tongue are framing your future. And that's what you're going to get. So in order to change that... You got to govern the tongue. Well, now James just said no man can control it. No man can control the tongue. Well, find me out of the abundance of the heart and mouth speaketh, please. Give me that scripture. Praise the Lord. Jesus said that a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what? Good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth evil things. Treasure of the heart. Now, you've all heard the computer acronym G-I-G-O. Some of you didn't know it came from computer programmers. That's where it came from. All right? Came from the programming world because <clears throat> these guys like Dick would write a nice, cool program on their IBM system uh, 360 mod 40. And they go over there and the key punchers would punch up the little 80 column cards with data 
you know, from stuff that came in. They run around and put them in the computer, run them, and they get all kind of messed up data, messed up reports. Why? Because the key puncher put the wrong stuff in. And because they put the wrong stuff in, you put garbage in. And they, but they want to blame the programmer. That computer's a piece of junk. I'm telling you right now, you people don't know what you're doing over there. Well, it wasn't them. It was the people who put the data in. Because the program was slick. The program did exactly what you told it to do. But because they put the wrong stuff, data in it, it took that data and did not give you what you were looking for. Garbage in, garbage out. In other words, the data has to be right. So then they started doing redundancy. People would do stuff, and then somebody would come behind them and redo it, make sure that it was done right. And, uh, you know, that helped clean up a lot of that because you can't run, uh, do all this work, and then keep putting in bad stuff and expect to get the right answer. But I've got a new acronym. W-I-W-O. Word in, word out. Amen? If you'll put the word in, you'll get word result, results out. Now, let me say this. You've already been doing your whole life putting G-I-G-O. You've been feeding on the words of the enemy. You've been speaking the words of Satan. You've been taking whatever the world says. You know, you know, and this, you, you know you're never going to have anything in this world. You didn't bring anything in. You got, you got church folk hooking up with the devil. Didn't bring anything in. Can't take anything out. I can take my treasures that I stored in heaven out. Glory to God. Amen. They're waiting on me up there. Remember, Jesus says store treasures up in heaven where moth doesn't enter in and rust doesn't corrupt. Hallelujah. But we have to learn <coughs> to change what we say so that we can get the right answers. Now, because, now, now, now listen here, um, Luke 6, that's where we'll just zip over there real quick. Or zip line over there. If you've got one in the church, you can zip over there real quick. Wouldn't that be fun? Now, anybody know who Jesus is? Well, one thing is Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. Look uh, in verse 43 of Luke 6. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. Neither doth a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Now, let me say something here. Why do we think we can keep putting corrupt stuff in and get, get good out? Hello. Why do we think we can circumvent the laws of God? And I'm, I'm so tired of hearing the only law that God has is law of love. Read your Bible a little bit better. And I'm talking about New Testament. I ain't even talking about Old Testament. I'm talking about New Testament. You know, laws, commandments, demands of God. The only thing we're supposed to do is, I'm telling you, what people have done with the love of God has brought damage to the church. Because we're, we're under the guise of the love of God. We are violating other things that God says don't do and to do and that kind of stuff. And it's, and it's brought disgrace and dishonor into the house of God. Grow up. Amen. You're going to have to stop eating Lucky Charms. Every day. Do you eat Lucky Charms every day? He loves Lucky Charms. I just said that just to aggravate you. You knew that. All right. But we got to grow up. You know, you, you can't, you cannot eat Lucky Charms breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day and expect to grow. Yeah! All right. All right, anyway. Regardless of my son-in-law's position in life, He, he, listen, we acknowledge he likes Lucky Charms. He loves Lucky Charms. He's addicted to Lucky Charms. Takes them intravenously. Anyway, <laughs> other people cannot live on Lucky Charms and grow. You can't live a diet in your life as a believer on natural things and expect to get the blessings of God working for you. Good fruit, fruit tree brings forth not corrupt fruit. A corrupt tree does not bring forth good fruit. Every tree is known by his own fruit. For thorns men do not gather figs, nor a bramble bush do they gather grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, listen to this, the mouth speaketh. How? See, this is it. James says the, the tongue is an unbeliever that no man can tame. No, you can't tame the tongue. You can't just make it say the right things. Amen. 
Hello? Oh, yes, Pastor. I'm telling you right now, I come to church when I, when, and when Brother Lloyd walked up to me and said, how am I doing? I said, I'm the blessed of the Lord. And we're, now listen, anybody can say something they want to say when there's no pressure. It is the pressure of life that brings out what's in abundance. Amen? You can look at me right now and say, what would you have for breakfast? I ain't telling you. You, you dump me down and jump on my stomach, you might find out. The pressure will cause it to come out. All right? There's Bojangles biscuit, there's egg, there's cheese, there's sausage. Hello? What happened? You put the right amount of pressure on things, and it's going to put whatever went in there is coming out. See, Pastor, that's too graphic. Did you get the picture? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, right now, if I go over, over dig and I get a, a balloon, and we just start filling it full of water. We've got it set up so it won't fall out of our hand, and we just keep putting water in it, and water just keeps going in and keeps going in there. What's going to eventually happen? And you know what? It's going to burst, and he's going to get wet. Why? Because it's not going to burst and be air and float up to the ceiling if we were putting water in there. He's going to get wet. Really wet. As a matter of fact, why don't we go get a balloon and let's demonstrate this. Hallelujah. Now, what you're putting in that balloon, now if, you, if we put that balloon, that same balloon over his head and start putting helium in it and just put, hook it up and just keep going. Pow! Guess what Dick's not going to get? Wet. Why? That helium's just going to float up, to the, up and up. You understand what I'm saying? Whatever we're putting in there in abundance is what we're going to get out. You're not going to get something else out. If you put sugar in your body in abundance, you're going to get, you know, well, not necessarily diabetes, but you're going to get, you're going to get sugar highs and you're going to get your, your body a little out of whack if you just sit there all day long. If you go home today and say, I'm not eating any food, I'm just drinking two liter Dr. Peppers or, you know, um, go, go down to the store over there, uh, uh, the, the meat market over there on Vandalia and get you some Mexican 7-Ups. You're going to drink all the Mexican 7-Ups or you get that home-style dairy chocolate milk that they sell out there outside they're, they're, uh, down there, random in Liberty Way, whatever that, that dairy is out there. And you start drinking just gallons of chocolate milk. I mean, you know, and put all that sugar in your body. It's going to be full of sugar. It's not going to be full of proteins. You can put all that sugar in your body. Your body's going to get overdosed with sugar. You, whatever you're doing, whatever you're putting in, in your body, it, an abundance is what, is what you've got in your body. Whatever you put into your spirit in abundance is what's in your spirit. Now, growing up as a kid, what we put in our spirits in abundance, or we, we listen to all the time, was the edge of night, as the, stomach, as the world turns, you know, uh, days of our life, uh, the young and the restless, and, and if you were really edgy, the dark shadows. Soap operas. They, I mean, starting about, uh, about um, what, 11 o'clock, all the way through the afternoon was soap opera after soap opera. After, on all three networks, they all had the soap operas. And I had family members who could tell you who was dating who, who had been married to who, who was getting ready to leave somebody and get with somebody else, who had been sleeping around over here, who had lied over this one, who had done that. They knew everything about every soap opera. And occasionally they got it mixed up. You really had a messed up soap opera. Okay? They knew all that. <clears throat> but couldn't give you one scripture if they needed healing. Couldn't give you one scripture if they needed deliverance. Couldn't give you one scripture if anything else in life they had needed. Why? Because all they ever did was put that stuff into them. And so we have it in our world today. We're putting all kinds of stuff into us. We're, and listen, and some of it's Christian, quote, quote, Christian teaching. You feed a diet of every wind of doctrine, and you're tossed to and fro. When you need real answers from God, there won't be anything there. Because you're full of all this other stuff. There's no faith there. You need to be full of the Word of God. Our job as ministers is to teach the Word, share the truth, give you the Scriptures so you can go study them and get filled up with the Word. Why? Because when that... How many, how many have ever seen a balloon blown up real, real tight? And somebody walked by with a little bitty pin 
itsy bitsy teeny weeny little pin and go and just touch it, it goes pow. Didn't hardly any pressure at all. Wow, it was so full, it was about to explode. We need to become so full of the word of God that when we're pricked, we explode. A number of years ago, I was, um, some, for those of you who have been to Raymond, you know what I'm talking about. You know where the Nanowski, the Nanowski Center is. But at Raymond, we, there was a skating rink, and it was, it was just a local skating rink. And halfway through my year at Raymond, uh, that skating rink went over, and Raymond bought it, bought the land and the skating rink. And then uh, a few years later, uh, not a few years, uh, several, numerous years later, they added on that, the gym. The gym was added on to the skating rink. That wasn't there originally. It was just the skating rink. And, um, and then before Raymond Bible Church got built, when Pastor in 85 said the Lord told him to start pastoring, and, and Dad was supposed to go back out on the road, Pastor started pastoring. Well, they outgrew Raymond Menace, uh, Ray, Rooker Memorial real quick. And so they had to leave Rooker Memorial and start having church in the, uh, in the gym. And they could seat 3,300 people in the gym. And then when they put the fire doors between the gym and the uh, skating rink, I think another 800 or so. So they, could, they got to where they could handle about 4,000 about 4, uh, for winter Bible seminar and stuff there. Okay? Well, was, oh, so anyway, back, back when we had a winter Bible seminar in there, in, in the gym before the church was built, uh, we, you know, I was there one day. I got in there late, we, so we got seats kind of at the back. Brother Copeland, Brother Savannah were sitting over there two, like two rows away from us. And um, at the end of the service, Brother Copeland got up and went across the street, and there was a Christian bookstore right across the street. And he went there, was just kind of walking around waiting for, you know, uh, Sister Gloria and, 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 and Jerry and Carolyn to get over there. And, and, and they were going to meet up and go get lunch. But he had to get away from the Raymond students, so they just attack you. I mean, they just all gather all around, and you wouldn't, they'd never get lunch. Because they're going to ask for the autograph. They're going to, you know, hound them, ask, have 50,000 questions. You know, you get these Raymond, some of these Raymond guys will go there and ask them some of the dumbest questions. They just did. They still do it. You know, and so he, he left right as the service, and you know, they were getting ready to dismiss so he could get out there and get out of that mess. Well, he's over at that bookstore, he kind of walking around, he sneezed. And the guy behind the counter went, you getting a coat? My God, I'm the healed of the Lord. I'm blessed coming in and going out. I want you to know that my body's well. First Peter 2, 24 says, by the stripes I was healed. Isaiah says, by the stripes we are healed. I bless the Lord all my soul and all that's within me. He forgives all my iniquities. He heals all my disease. Went on about 10, 15 minutes like that. When he got done, I mean, he kind of stopped, looked at the guy, and the guy went, my God, brother, you believe it, don't you? <laughs> what happened? He was so full of the word when he got pricked boom it came out all over the place he didn't go well no but my confession is no see there's a difference now let me i'm not making fun of something i want you to hear me real clear we mistaught in the foundation years of word of faith confession by terminology not by implementation we taught that it was a confession to take the word of God and go, now by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. By the stripes of we were healed. If I were healed, we say, that'd make your daily confession. Really what we were doing is we were doing what Joshua 1.8 says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate. And that word in the Hebrew meant to mutter day and night. We called it confession. Which then got confusing when we said, make your confession of faith. So we have people walk around making a confession unto faith. See, of and unto are two different things. Because really the confession unto faith is meditation. You're not in faith. You're building faith. You're putting the treasure in. You're putting the treasure in until it gets there in abundance. But we, because we called a confession and people wrote confession books and they said, here's our daily confessions. You know, we were, we were calling it confession. And then when somebody come teach, once you've made your confession, don't ever say anything else. Yeah, but I'm not in faith yet. No, 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 no. You make your confession. You, you took Wigglesworth. If you made your confession one time and say something else, you're in unbelief. See, and it's all, it was semantics that brought confusion. You understand what I'm saying? It's not wrong. As a matter of fact, you have to do the front end process of meditation or quote, as we would say, make a confession. But that confession was unto faith or really it was meditating or muttering unto faith so that we got to the point we had in our heart in abundance. 
that word, so that when something came and pricked it, what was in there in abundance came out of the confession of faith. We moved from simply building the treasure until we were so full of the treasure, that's all we could get out. Are y'all getting this now? <clears throat> the, the confusion happened because we used the wrong terminology. And really, in one sense, it may not be wrong terminology, but because of the confusion it brought, it was. So that people began to not know the difference between confessing faith and meditating. So then we would start taking principles that apply to the confession of faith and put them on the confession unto faith, and we were short-circuiting our own building process. Now, this isn't the first time I've, ta I've taught this in the past. People didn't get it. They didn't listen to it. They didn't, they didn't receive it. Whatever. I'm telling you, this is accurate. This is accurate. If we will confess or better stated, meditate, mutter the word, we build the treasure. And what did Jesus say? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And then he goes on down and says that um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We can all sit here. I can walk up to Cap and say, Cap, how are you doing today? And he knows that if he says the wrong thing, a confession people will go off and I'll cast that confe lying devil confession thing out of him. I wouldn't say that, brother, if I were you. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't believe that. I didn't believe what I was trying to say, you know. And so the captain sits there, he sits there real quiet and goes, um, 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 I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. I'm the head, not the tail. How's that, pastor? <laughs> well, that's great if you're building a treasure. Do you really believe it? That's the next question. Well, I'm not sure if I believe it. That's okay. See, there's no condemnation to, I'm not sure if I really believe it. Keep saying it. Keep muttering it. Keep building the abundance. You put the first blow of air into a balloon, it's not full. Go. You keep doing it until it gets full. We stay with our meditation or muttering of the word until we're full. And how do you know when you're full? That when you're prick, that's all that comes out. It's not, well, I'm not really sure. I had not seen any difference. I'm not, I really don't know. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to hold, I'm trying to hold fast and say the right thing. No, 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 no. It's got to be when you're prick. Boom, it all comes flying out. It just ain't got nowhere else to go. And there's nothing else in there. You've, by, by filling yourself up with the word, by muttering. Now, remember, you call it confession. You probably got books at home, you know, uh, my daily scriptures on healing, or my daily scriptures on prosperity, or my daily scriptures on health, or my daily scriptures on wisdom. You may have all the, listen, not daily scriptures, my, my daily confessions of healing, my daily confessions of prosperity, you know, uh, all the confession books. Just change that word confession to meditation. Well, I need to make a good confession. No, 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 you need to meditate. Because let me say, can I say this? Y'all look at me real good. Listen to this real good. If, because Jesus said this, not Pastor Ed, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Let me tell you that if you will continue to meditate and continue to meditate and mutter, remember when meditate and mutter means the same, same Hebrew word. If you continue to mutter and meditate, mutter, meditate, mutter, meditate. You won't have to wonder if you've got faith because something will come along and prick you and boom, faith's going to come out. You don't have to, am I in faith yet? Am I in faith yet? Am I in faith? Just keep putting it in. I said just keep putting it in and keep putting it in. And you do it. You, you got to say it. Yeah, listen, listen. I love tapes. Or, excuse me. I love MP3s and MP4s. Okay? You know? Oh, let's go, let's go. Papaya. Right, right on script on, on, on animal skin. You know? I love 
listening to teachings from people who, who teach faith and teach the word, and that is good. It points you in a direction. But let me say this. Listening to Brother Hagin teach faith and you muttering the words of faith from the script, speaking the word, meditating the word, are two different things. His teaching will point you in the direction to act. You have to act. You have to act on the word. So we love Dad Hagen. We love Brother Cook. We love the things we've learned. We love Brother Summerall, the Wigglesworth, the things we've taught, the things we've learned. Those things that point us in the right direction. But you, you, say me, have to take and mutter the word yourself. You have to speak it. It's not enough for Pastor Ed to come and say, I declare over you and this, you know. I mean, I, this, now, I'm going to be honest with you, folks. Maybe, maybe you get upset with me. I get tired of these people getting on the Facebook and saying, I declare that every evil spirit and everything I pose against you is going to go away today in Jesus' name. It really, why didn't Jesus just do that? Why did he not go up to Solomon's porch and wipe the whole bunch out? It doesn't work that way. Just because prophet, apostle, uh, his majesty so-and-so says so. Don't make it so. You're going to have to get that word. Now, listen, it's one thing for God to have a minister or a pastor or someone speak a word to you so that you can lay hold of by faith. But this is just blanket coverage for the whole world. Don't work. Why don't we just say, everybody gets saved, we're going to heaven tomorrow. Well, glory to God. Sell your house. Sell your car. Get rid of the wife and the kids. Go up to the mountaintop. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. It don't work that way. How it works is you hear messages like this. You go get your Bible out. No, I love the leather on this. My God, that's like. Hallelujah. I have a new Bible. Thank you, Cap. You gotta give me yours. But you take, you, take, you take the word and you begin to speak that word. So if you, do you need healing? Then you take the scriptures that, that promise and declare healing. And you start muttering them. Well, how am I going to know when I'm in faith? I'll tell you, you'll get there. Because you keep putting it in. Jesus said, if there's an abundance of it, your mouth will speak it. You won't have to conscientiously make yourself go. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of my, my church folks. And uh, as Pastor Ed, uh, 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 by his stripes, I'm healed. I got it, Pastor, didn't I? But the neighbor came over and you said, my God, I feel like death warmed over twice. See, there's not, it's not in there in abundance. It's not in abundance. How do I get it in abundance? You put it in there. I said, you put it in there. How do I put it in there? My tongue is as a pen of a ready writer. Your tongue writes on the tables of your heart. You keep speaking the word. You keep writing the word. You keep speaking the word. And you're writing, as you're speaking, it's writing on your heart. And you keep doing it until you get pricked. And when you get pricked, what do you mean get pricked? How you doing? I want you to know I'm blessed, healed of God, glory be to God. First, I mean, you, 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 it wasn't the conscientious thing. It wasn't you tried to muster it up. It wasn't, well, I got to make the right confession. It just came out. Because you're in abundance. I said you're in abundance. I like chocolate milk containers in abundance in my refrigerator. <laughs> Made with real sugar, not corn syrup. Food Line's plastic jug chocolate milk is made with sugar, not corn syrup. Ooh, it's good. When I pour that out, you know, when, if I prick that when it's full, now when it gets down into you, really got, you got to almost turn it upside down to get it out, you know, shake it. Nathan went in that last night and said, you drank all this. I said, I didn't drink it all. Somebody else had a, had a glass. I said, go ahead, buddy, finish it off. Shannon gets that, because Shannon likes the chocolate milk too, but I, we kind of have a chocolate milk group in our house. I'm the big dog. Nathan and Shannon are kind of like fighting over each other. But go on. Shannon's sticking her nose in here, because like, we're running after 12. There. I'm not going to stop just because it's after 12, because this is too good for you. I am going to stop. What does it mean when Pastor Ed says, I'm about to close? I heard someone had it right. There you go. Absolutely nothing. And see, that's what's in our heart in abundance. <laughs> and that's what came out. <laughs> 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 
There's your allegory for the day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you understand that if we'll take, now, now I, I've, I've jumped all over the place and left some things. We'll get some more things next week. But when we feed on the word of God, and we, and we use terms, and, and see, we use these terms in our charismatic word of faith circles that sometimes didn't bring the right clarity for the majority of people. Some people, they got it. They understood what it meant and all that kind of stuff. And they went and said, maybe they went under Dad Hagen. They listened to enough that they, they got it. They, they got past the, the, the little glittery, glamoury, whoo, I could have anything I want thing and got, really got down into there. But when we say feed on the Word, we're talking about meditating the Word, muttering the Word. That's how you feed on the Word. You read it. You, you, you mutter it. The Holy Spirit's your teacher. Builds in an abundance. And I am telling you, y'all listening real good? When it gets there to where it's an overflowing abundance, when you get pricked, that's what's coming out. Because Jesus said that's what was going to happen. And until, well, Pastor Ed, I studied for three weeks and I still made a negative confession. I'm glad you studied for three weeks. Study for three more. Meditate three more. Keep speaking it. Don't quit. Don't give up because you got pricked and the other stuff came out. Oh, okay. That's still in there. Keep feeding on the other stuff until it pushes all the other stuff out. Keep feeding on the word until it dries all the other out. Keep saying what the word says until there's nothing in there in abundance but what the word says. And then what's going to happen? Out of that abundance, your mouth is going to speak and it's not going to be speaking unto faith. It's going to be declaring faith. Because you've built the good treasure and you filled it up. And now all you can, all you got to say is what the word says. That's a lot of work. Well, be poor, stupid. That wasn't nice. Be poor, lazy. Hello? You want to stay poor? Keep saying it. Don't take the time to put the word in. Stop whining about not having it and start saying what God says about it. Until when somebody says, have you got enough? My God, I got more than enough. By God meets my riches, my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I gave and he gives unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Glory be to God. I brought the tithe and the offering into the storehouse. And I proved God. He opened up heaven's windows and empties out on me. Blessed I don't have room enough to receive. My Lord Jesus said to give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I want you to know that I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. I'm blessed in the fruit of my body, blessed in the field, blessed in the cattle, blessed in my vineyards. Hallelujah. Everything I touch is blessed. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. All of a sudden, they just got popped out. Not, well, brother, I wouldn't say that. I know, but that's how I feel. Gloom, despair, agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, agony on me. Well, my God, wonder why you're so depressed. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving.